My name is Peter Richards. Uh, I'm an artist. I, I'm from San Francisco in California, and uh, s my wife Sue Richards and I are here at Imaraf uh, as fellows, and we've been here since 2010, and we've spent three months here for the last three years. So this is our final session. Um, I, I worked at the Exploratorium for many years as, uh, as an exhibit builder, as a program officer, and I ran the artist in residence there for many years. And, uh, and for the last six or seven years before I retired, I was a senior artist. At the same time, I've maintained a, uh, a career uh, in art, and I've been interested primarily in doing projects in public places. And an under underlying theme of my work has been water in, in many cases. And uh, Sue and I have collaborated on a, a number of projects. I've collaborated with other people, uh, including scientists. So collaboration and the sort of exchange of ideas is an important part of what I and we do. Uh, the nature of water has always been a part of my vocabulary as an artist. Uh, I'm interested in its physicality, its ability to make things grow, how it makes me feel when I'm in it or on it or looking at it. I love the dynamics of water, whether it's in a ditch or a river or a stream or an estuary. And uh, being around fresh water makes me feel secure. I, things are good if we have fresh water around me. Um, Damming up ditches when I was a little boy with my brother was uh, something that would keep us busy for days on time, on end. And uh, um, I, I don't know, I've watched kids, and you, you've probably never seen a kid avoid a, a, a mud puddle. If there's a mud puddle, the kid goes right through it. But at the same time, I've, always, I've noticed that um, when there's a body of water nearby, I always end up at the edge of it, kind of looking into the water, and it seems like everybody else around me is doing the same thing. So there's, uh, there's a real psychological, at least for me, a psychological power to water, and I can do a little experiment that maybe uh, shows that we all have it. Uh, if I tell you that my mouth is really dry and I'm thirsty, I, I expect that most of you also are experiencing a dry mouth and feeling a little thirsty. No? <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> um, so what is it? Why are we programmed to respond to water the way we do? And I don't really know, uh, but uh, probably the answer is related to our attach our that our attachment to water is to say is to say the obvious we if we didn't have it we wouldn't be here but anyway the work that I'm going to show you today is uh, certainly celebrates water I love it and like to share it with others some of the work that I'm going to show is about the nature of water and the way it behaves some of it's related to historical events that is associated with water, and most of them are sort of a combination of the three. They all are related to this idea of sense of place, addressing the human propensity for feeling an attachment to places, and most are the results of collaborations. But first, uh, before I show that work, I want to uh, share a few things about water that interests me and, uh, and, it kind of, and the things that kind of set it apart from other substances. Um, so I say I like water, I like the physicality of it, I, I like its very nature, and I'm supposed to change the slide here. Uh, I've experimented with the way it reflects light, the way it freezes and melts, the way it sounds, the way it moves through a landscape how it responds to wind, and how it beha behaves in tidal situations. I'm interested in water as a social catalyst, and I'm interested in what happens at the edge of water, and I'm interested in the psychological power of water. Water moves around the planet in a manner 
that, is a day, that has a day-to-day -day and sometimes hour-to-hour -hour effect on our lives. The water cycle describes the movement, where it comes from and where it goes. And this has been understood oddly enough, only since the 18th century. And we've only recently learned the consequences of its interruptions. Water emanates from the ground, collects in low places, evaporates, travels the globe as vapor, waiting for the right conditions to allow it to condense and fall back to earth, where it not only sinks back into the ground, it flows across the landscape with the power to cleave mountains and to wash them into the sea as it fluctuates back and forth between ice, liquid to solid. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, it becomes a gas at 100. When it condenses, it releases heat. And this is what drives the fury of a hurricane. With changes in atmospheric pressure, these freezing and boiling temperatures change accordingly. I grew up in the mountains at an elevation of approximately uh, 2,700 meters, and it took uh, five minutes to cook a three-minute egg because the water boils at only 82 degrees at that elevation. As a liquid, water is almost incompressible. Its molecule can be thought of as being very hard, and if it's shot from a very small orifice, you can cut steel with it. And then there's uh, adhesion and cohesion. These are the factors that modify the, the horizontal surfaces of water and gives it its many characteristics. Adhesion is the attraction between water molecules and other objects, and cohesion is the attraction. <laughs> um, is the attraction of water molecules for each other. That is why water drops form, its surface tension is high, aiding in its propensity for beating. Because of its specific heat is high, it takes a lot to raise water temperatures, one degree. This is good because then we don't have wide temperature fluctuations in our oceans and lakes. Water is densest at four degrees Celsius, so when the surface of a lake reaches four, four degrees, it begins to sink pushing water, warmer water up to the surface. This process has to continue until all of the water in the lake is at four degrees before it can begin to start to freeze. The polar ice caps also help maintain the Earth's uh, heat equilibrium. They refle reflect heat from, from the sun, and as we know, that's beginning to change. 80% of the body is water, and the mineral, mineral composition of seawater and the body are very similar. There are over, over 7 billion people on Earth, and over a billion of them drink non-potable water. And these numbers are increasing, as are the numbers of people with kidney failure. The per capita consumption of water in large American cities is around 600 liters a day. It takes 40,000 liters of water to make one ton of sugar, and it takes 240,000 to make one ton of paper, and 260 for a ton of steel. Yet, as humans, we only need about four liters a day to live. When uh, Sue and I first moved to San Francisco in the early 70s to work at the Exploratorium, it was the first time that I'd lived near an ocean, and I really was uh, interested in the tides. A friend of mine from the Exploratorium and I became infatuated with the fact that with a tide book, you could uh, predict where the level of water was going to be at any given time. So with the power of this idea, we did a series of temporary floating light sculptures that were uh, installed completely in, in submerged and, and at the beginning of an evening and as the light as the tide went out the lights were slowly slowly revealed now on, the, on these two images um, the upper left uh, this is right at the beginning of the installation and there were two shapes two V shapes the upper one was the tip of the upper one was right at the surface the lower shape was completely submerged the lower right, this is uh, six hours later, the uh, upper V-shape is completely revealed and the lower one is, is still submerged. And that 
that worked out just exactly as we planned. The, the surprise and interesting thing for us was the relationship between the lights that were floating on the surface then and the movement of the water. The wind in this area, this is in Fort Mason, San Francisco, the wind was coming from left to right and it was pushing waves down those two lines and the waves would cover over the lights and then expose them again. So it was almost like a, a oscilloscope trace as these waves kept moving across. Then we found that to be quite interesting. So that series kindled an interest in the relationship between the surface of, wa of the water and the wind. These are two gorilla projects that we did uh, sort of out and about. One is in China Camp, which is in a bay north of San Francisco. We just went out there at night and did it and uh, didn't get caught. And uh, the other one is in, is in Oakland. And in both cases, we pulled uh, one end of the lights or a portion of the string of lights up into the air with helium balloons. These lights, by the way, are chemiluminescent lights. So anyway, um, so the, we established a relationship between the wind and the water. And, uh, and these are time exposures. So this is a capturing maybe two or three minutes of time. So you get a very subtle image of the, how the wind was behaving at that moment or those moments. This one was done at Fort Point, which is right at the base of uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And at this site that we learned that when the tide was coming in under the gate, the gate is, Golden Gate Bridge is the upper left. When the water was flowing into the bay, there was a large eddy that was actually flowing right along the shoreline here in the opposite direction. So we designed this piece to behave as it is right now, but uh, later on in the evening, as the tide changed, the tail of this sort of angry dragon swung around and slipped in under the pier, and uh, which was quite dramatic. These are all temporary pieces. They'd last for the ev evening and then they'd be done. Um, this was, uh, this, this project is probably uh, my favorite project of all the ones that I've done and I think it's because it sort of takes me back to those days when I was damming ditches with my brother. It was an opportunity for me to really engage seriously with playing, playing in the water. This was a, uh, this piece or this site is uh, in Mill Valley, California, which is just north of San Francisco. Uh, it's in a park. It's uh, this old. This structure is an old mill that was built, a sawmill that was built in 19 or 1835 by a, a early pioneer. It was the first lumber mill in that part of the country, and uh, so it's sitting there as a as a artifact at this point. And my intention was to kind of reconnect the sawmill to its source of power, which is the creek, and to maybe think about that span of time and how land uses have changed in that area over that time. Because Mill Valley now is a bedroom community. Um, and, as, and as I mentioned, my ulterior motive was just to play in the water. So I, anyway, I built a flume, I connected with a, with a dam that was upstream about 200, oh, I don't know, 220 feet. And uh, built, uh, ran the flume underneath the, the, the road and then down along the side of the creek and then finally underneath the mill structure and, um, and then back back to the creek itself and at the final the final section of this flume was pivot would would pivot so as the water would fill up the final section it reach a point of overcoming the center of gravity and it tip forward and dump the water into the creek. So it did this sort of metronomic action. It would tip about every 20 seconds and it was like it was counting off time since, since the uh, sawmill had been built. The surprise and uh, sort of happy accident here was that uh, it turns out the flume was really accessible for kids. 
I, there's a playground right next next to where I was working, and I, as I was building this thing, I noticed that the, the mothers were really concerned about the kids playing in the creek. But here, there's a little cross section of the creek. They could walk in it, they could sit in it, they could float boats down it, they could uh, dam it up, and uh, they, you know, so they loved it. At the same time, for me, it was again, it was like a cross section of the creek. You could. You could see little fish swimming along. You could really examine the water up close, and I and I really love the 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 action of the flume itself. This is this piece is called a spring. It was done at uh, Art Park in Lewiston, New York, in uh, 1987 through 89. It was like a multi-year project. Uh, the site. This, the site has been a place of human habitation for hundreds of years. Uh, a village of Tuscarora Indians were here at this site when the first, first French trappers came, came up the Niagara River in the early 18th century. Uh, the Indians were soon in business helping the Europeans portage their boats around Ni the Niagara Falls a few miles up from the stream. And as the traffic increased, so did the population to a point that it was a strategic military site during the French and Indian Wars and during the War of 1812. In the early 1960s, the spring and most of the site, be, uh, the area behind the photographer here was filled with uh, debris from a, uh, a new hyd uh, hydroelectric dam. So it just filled up this whole little valley. And, uh, but the stream kept running and it kind of runs out the, from underneath it uh, down the, the original aurora. So my proposal was to restore the spring so that it could once again be a place for people to gather around and to get water, cool water. And the water is potable so that you could drink it. So uh, uh, we created this place. Place is in a sort of a low place, uh, a, a low area, well shaded. The cool water cooled the air around it, so e even on a day like today or a room like today, we would be cool. <laughs> um, I found a glacial stone in a, a glacial moraine, which is uh, which we made the the bowl out of. You can see the striations on the edge of that bowl, so it was a it was a boulder that had been pushed around during the ice age probably for thousands of years. And it did come, become a place where people would gather. Uh, this project was, is the one that I'm probably best known for. It's called the Wave Organ, and it's done in San Francisco. It's uh, on the northern waterfront. It's built on a jetty that sticks out into the, uh, into the bay. Uh, you can see uh, Alcatraz in the upper right which is uh, our Chateau d'If, and, uh, and the Angel Island up to the north is uh, sort of our retinal in the Friol. This is where uh, we would process immigrants and quarantine them, et cetera. So it's kind of a similarity between the two places. The wave organ itself is a wave-activated sound sculpture. There are somewhere around 25 pipes that extend down into the water and the, the movement of the water, excuse me? Oh. <laughs> the movement of the water in and out of the pipes creates a musical sound, and you'll hear that in a moment. Uh, the other way to locate this piece is that behind it here, you see the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's got this amazing, I mean, talk about a sense of place. When you're at this site, you have this view of the Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz, and downtown San Francisco and you're really not on land and you're not in water. You're in this narrow spit, artificial land, and so you're in a sort of a neutral zone, and it's a great place to be if you want to be away. <laughs> you're, right next to the, you're right next to the wilderness, but you're also almost home. Uh, this is the sound that the wave organ makes. activates the air column, which 
creates a sound. The air column of the pipe. If the wave moves on up the pipe, the air column gets shorter, so the pitch goes up. And it's sort of demonstrated here with these jugs. The jug with the least amount of water has the lowest pitch, etc. And then also, you can be. It's also analogous to a conch shell or listening to the sound of a conch shell. Anyway, it's a wonderful public place. All kinds of different people use it. Day and night, it's public. There's no restrictions at all to its use. Uh, okay. Um, sort of as a derivation of the wave organ, Sue and I were invited to do an installation on Lake Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, we were in, uh, right across the lake from Montreux in the French side of the lake. And we participated in a, a water festival. This is about 1996, I guess. And uh, we were able to get the hull of this old sailboat, which happened to have been a sailboat that was uh, sailed in the 1960 Olympics in Japan. And we used it as a sound chamber and a canopy for a sound sculpture that worked very much the same way that uh, the wave organ does, except for the wave organ is tidal. This, this, the lake fluctuation here is very slight. So the ends of the pipes here are floating on the surface rather than being fixed. And this will give you a sense of uh, what this installation sounded like. One of the things that uh, Sue and I have been working on here in Marseille is uh, we've been hoping to uh, identify a site and, uh, and create a, a piece for Marseille. And uh, one of the places that we've been focusing on is along the shoreline uh, below Palais du Faro uh, at the mouth of Vuport. And uh, we have a, uh, a team of people that are helping us uh, gain permission and uh, find support to do this. And we've, we've been uh, sort of working on this for the last three years. And we started with four ideas. And we're down to one, which was our goal two years ago. So we're a little bit behind. But uh, this, this idea seems to have uh, some excitement behind it. The folks that are interested are really uh, determined to see if they can make it happen. So we'll we'll see. But it's it's the perfect place for a wave organ. Uh, this was done. This is called Grand Grandin Gardens, and it was done in a zoo that was being transformed from a zoo into a, a public park. And uh, they were inviting artists to do temporary pieces during the transition. And uh, so I. I was really interested in the uh, the lakes and the little canals around the, around the park because they were so still that uh, there was no wind that could get in there, so they were like glass. So I decided to play with the uh, re reflectivity. So I used mylar ribbons that are attached to an armature to create a cone-like form and. Uh, the mylar from this side reflected the light from the sky, and then the water repeated this reflection in the water. So it's kind of, kind of beautiful. Uh, from the inside, the mylar reflected the water itself, which included the shadows made by the mylar. So the, as these two reflective surfaces passed information back and forth, the images became quite complex and quite disorienting. If I mean, I would stand there and look into this thing, and because my eye couldn't find a place to fix itself so that you could kind of gain your balance. You really felt like you almost had vertigo. So it was, that, was a, that was a real surprise. Um, 
1994, I taught a class for the Code of Art in Aix-en-Provence and, uh, and uh, on art and landscape. And part of, as part of this class, we spent, I think, almost a month at Le Creste, which is an art center near vaison la romaine And uh, one of the students that was in the class was here today, as Dean Sejo. And uh, so collaborative, so one of our collaborative projects was to do something with this bridge. And uh, so using the same mylar that I used in Florida, we suspended those, these ribbons from the ridge rail into the water where they were held by weights. Uh, again, there was, we were interested in the reflectivity, but also creating a, a visual link between the water and the winds that move up and down the river as the temperature, temperatures fluctuate. So this is a uh, little video that a friend of ours, uh, Jean Biagini, made of this installation. Um, the last day of the installation, the Mistral came up the river, and you can see what it was doing with, with the piece. It was just, it was wild. The Mylar was popping like rifle shots, and it is fantastic. Uh, one of my earliest, earliest memories is my father and, a, and our neighbors harvesting ice from a frozen lake near our house in Colorado. Uh, the blocks of ice were uh, stored in a small house like the one that you see here. And uh, then in the summer, we, of course, go to the ice house, get a block, and bring it in for the ice box. And, but I do remember going with my father to get a chunk. He'd always break a corner of the block off for me to suck on while he was wrestling the ice. And there was part of this memory was this really intense smell of the pine sawdust that was used to uh, insulate the ice. Very strong memory. Uh, and I, you know, in, in thinking about these ice blocks now, I, I kind of think of them as time capsules. You know, they, they were frozen in the winter, they were saved, we could pull them back out and then release that time and that heat energy, of course, uh, in the ice box. So um, I got an opportunity at Messiah College, which is in Pennsylvania, to do something with this memory. And I, so I stacked, I don't know, 15 or 20 blocks of ice. These are pretty large. They're 200 pound blocks of ice in a triangular shaped wall. And then I covered it with sawdust. Then over the six week period of, this, of the show, this ice slowly melted and the sawdust has absorbed the water. And uh, Here's another view. This is right when it began. And uh, then this is six weeks later. And uh, it changed quite a bit. We also seeded the uh, uh, sawdust with grass seed and we had grow lights. So as the, as the water absor was absorbed, it sprouted the grass. So at the end, there was, it was kind of pathetic. They were very spindly looking pieces of grass, but at least they did sprout. Uh, there was one man, I was told by the gallery director that there was a man who came every day to check progress. And uh, it seemed like every day he told the same story about when he was a kid, he had an ice house and he liked the smell of the sawdust. So that was, it was kind of funny to catch that. Um, this project is about land use uh, and land and water remediation. I was a member of the Acid Mine Drainage and Art Team. I was developing methods for neutralizing acid mine drainage in the coal country of uh, west, southwestern Pennsylvania. This, this area is riddled with uh, old mine shafts that are just going every which way, honeycombs of them. And after they stop working them, they fill up with water. 
and as they fill up with water, they leach. The water leaches out acids and heavy metals out of the rock formations, and then this water leaks out into the rivers and uh, raises the pH, kills, or raises the city of the, of the river, kills the fish and everything else. So there's this network of dead rivers in this part of the world. And at the same time, because the coal mines are shut down, the economy's shot. So, so these people are sitting in these villages, you know, in a depressed state. They're, and it seemed that the only, perhaps, way of getting themselves out is to clean up the rivers so they could use them for, for recreation and tourist uses. So our project was to do a, a demonstration project showing that uh, with the application of arts, science, historians, and uh, engineering that there could be a solution to uh, this problem that you could fix, uh, you could fix this situation in certain instances. So uh, our team, in, uh, our project was led by a historian from the Federal Office of Surface Mining in Washington, D.C. Uh, the team included a geologist, several several artists, a landscape architect, and a, an engineer, and a evolving staff of AmeriCorps volunteers. And these these young people were the ones that were kind of doing the heavy lifting in a way. They were doing the grunt work. In other words, they were running the organization. And uh, and the project, I don't know, took six or seven years. Um, but we finally got something that, that did work, and I won't go into a lot of detail about it, but uh, I think the most difficult aspect, you have five minutes? The most difficult aspect of the project was to get the city of Vin Vintendale, the town of Vintendale, which is right next to this site, to buy into it and to set aside a piece of land where this remediation system could work. And, uh, and to actually believe they could, that they could do it. And uh, our project manager was a real uh, a rainmaker, and he was able to rally the troops, and they, they finally got into it. And it, it's become a, uh, a real showcase. There's new businesses that have opened up in the, in the town now. There's a, a new bicycle path that goes through the park. And uh, so it's, and it's become a, a model project throughout the Appalachia region. Um, located in South Lake Union Park in Seattle is this 7 by 10 meter floating acoustic sculpture that Sue and I did. Uh, I think we completed it in 2010. We're util utilizing the inverted hull of a Blanchard Junior Knockabout, which is a um, built by the Blanchard Boat Company that had built boats on the South Lake Union for over 50 years. Uh, many are still floating and they're really co real collector's items now. Uh, the Center for Wooden Boats, which is also on Lake Union, donated the boat hull for us to use as a canopy and sound chamber. And they collude, uh, collaborated with Sue and I on many aspects of the project. Um, with a few exceptions, oh wait, before I just say that, I, one of the things I wanted to mention, you know, you were talking about, uh, Patrice, you, you and Javier were talking about uh, playing around with uh, reflecting waves, and uh, the, front, sir, the front edge of this platform has a skirt that's spherical, and it goes down below, um, the wave, wave amplitude of the waves that come down from the north. And, uh, and the idea is that they, as the waves come in, they would be reflected by the spherical mirror and then they would uh, meet at the focal point, which is about half the, half the uh, radius, I think, and create this uh, little spout. And uh, we've never seen it happen. Um, we've, you know, we've, been there several times. It, the wind is never blowing. There's no waves. But a friend of, of ours sent us this photograph recently. And if you look, you can see see those subtle ripples right in front of that curved edge. And it it looks like it might be working. <laughs> so I, I just discovered that last night when I was looking at this photo. So 
anyway, uh, with uh, a few exceptions, most of the work that I've shown today invites people to the edge of water to look at it and to be next to it. In this situation, we wanted to have people be in it or on it, to be as close to water as possible without getting wet. We wanted them to feel the movement of the water, relate that move, the movement of the water to the sounds that this piece makes, and uh, uh, the, relate it to the boat wakes that are traveling in and out, and, uh, and in some cases relate the movement to the wind that they were experiencing. We wanted them to have an experience that was very much like being on a boat, and uh, and I think and I think it works. Um, our work is about again about it being a part of a place rather than being a casual observer. It's about being engaged and present through one's senses. Perception is an important part of our work, and these these works were orchestrated to set the stage for a person or people to have an experience slightly out of the norm of their everyday lives. Um, in, in the cases that I've shown you here, the catalyst for these experiences has been water. So, thank you.